It's like a dream come true. Welcome to the opening weekend of the Edinburgh International Science Festival. My name is Setu Vijay Kumar and I'm a professor of robotics at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm Fran Robinson, I'm a presenter and I have had the pleasure of working with Honda for quite a few years and together we are going to take you on a fascinating journey with one of the most amazing robots of the century, Asimo. And along the way, talk to you about the science behind making it all happen. Since I was a child, I had a dream a dream about fascinating, complex, cool machines that would become part of our everyday life. As a young boy, I wished I could build something that would find my lost toys, tidy up my room after me, be an understanding friend, or even do my homework for me. Little did I know then that robots have captured the imagination of mankind for centuries, inspiring scientists, science fiction writers, and filmmakers to create some of the most iconic pieces of their times. Leonardo da Vinci's Mechanical Knight, Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, and of course, who can forget Star Wars and R2-D2. And through these works, the idea of robots has been and remains a science fiction dream, sometimes friendly, sometimes terrifying. Robots have been given human and sometimes superhuman qualities by authors like Arthur C. Clarke, creator of HAL in 2001 Space Odyssey. But what does it take to make a dream come true? To, to function in today's world, you and I need to be able to sense, reason, and move, and do this quickly and reliably. So robots and intelligent machines are no different. They have the same challenges to solve. So we are equipped with a sense of sight, touch, and sound. We can use this to recognize people and objects, understand their speech and movements, and respond appropriately or even imitate. One interesting way of capturing movements, especially for programming robots, is, is by recording how we humans move. So can we have a volunteer to try and move this robot animation? I'm going to choose this lady here in pink. Would you like to come with me? What's your name? Naomi, oh, what a gorgeous name. Fantastic, would you like to stand with Joanne, Naomi? Thank you. So Naomi is holding in her hand this magnetic sensor called a flock of birds. When she moves her hand, the computer captures her arm movement, and then we use a sophisticated program to transfer this joint movements onto the joint movements of the robot. In a moment, you will see an <laughs> animation of the robot hand that Naomi is actually controlling. <laughs> and this is actually a real dynamics animation of a robot we have at the School of Informatics, just across the, across the street here. And when Naomi moves her hand, the sensor transmits that information and she's doing a very good job of actually hitting the target and moving the pendulum. <laughs> That's amazing. The arm is actually mimicking yes. Naomi's arm. That's fantastic. Now that, are you, are you mastering it now then, Naomi? Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> conducting an orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank very you very much. much. Can we have a round of applause for Naomi, please? Thank you. That's a very cool way to sense, very different from, say, using cameras. But can the captured movements be modified, um, say, to account for some obstacles, for example? Indeed, Fran, that's a key challenge to make robots autonomous. For example, to get them to move without having humans actually direct them how to do it. So one key way of doing that is to equip them with an ability to plan long movement sequences while taking into account unpredictable changes in the environment. This is something we do exciting research at the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh as well. So in this um, motion capture video, you can see this is an interesting way of capturing human movement, essentially using vision-based sensors. Now you can capture this movement and now put it to play on virtual animated characters. So in other words, transfer human movements onto what are called avatars. But actually, what is really interesting is to see how we can alter 
this basic captured motion and say, get it to avoid, say, randomly moving obstacles. So in this next video, you see these two <laughs> animated characters, or avatars, trying to carry a rather heavy box. It wouldn't be able to do that on its own. And on top of that, it's, it's got to plan and avoid this randomly arriving obstacles, these balls. You wouldn't want that, that, that removal job, would you, really, to be honest with those coming at you? <laughs> now, in addition to controlling, say, two characters, we can also use sophisticated computer programs to create dynamic crowd behavior. So, for example, in this case, um, the crowd is trying to avoid, in this case, a pesky rat. <laughs> Can you imagine in the middle of a gym, all the muscle men working out going, oh, a mouse. <laughs> but these are virtual animations and computer graphics, as we can see. How do you get the real robots to do these tricks? If we want to create, say, a CP3O or a Wally, -E, how do you stop the real robots from constantly bumping into things? You're absolutely right, Fran. It may be hard to plan the right movements, but it's actually a lot harder to realize them with real machines. By the way, did you know the hardest thing for a chess playing robot to do with current technology is not, as you might think, figuring out which piece to move or where to move them to, but to actually reach for the piece and actually physically make the move. So let's look at a real machine, the Condo Mini Humanoid. I love this little guy. So this Mini Humanoid has got multiple degrees of freedom, very similar kind of joints of a human being. So in theory, it should be able to replicate the movements, for example, the movements that I make. Mm -hmm. So Fran, yeah. now I'm going to put this little guy to a test. Right. So let's check if he's really fit and if he can keep up with my exercise routine. You're going to show us some exercise moves, Setu. Exactly. Can't wait. Very uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> right, one, two, three. Okay, I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's try if Kondo can repeat that. Yeah, that would be great. Oh, introducing himself. <laughs> Very good. Now, surely, you, I was going to say, he goes, goes down as well. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, he's giving up because he doesn't want to put you to too much shame, so I think Kondo deserves a round of applause. <laughs> ah. Now he's really showing off there. <laughs> that is amazing. Now, obviously, in this demonstration, Kondo is moving its arms and limbs in doing exactly what it's been asked to perform. But Kondo is being told exactly what to do. It is not making the decisions for itself. So scientists around the world, including at the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh, are trying very hard to give the robots ability to learn. So in this next video clip, we're going to see how a robot tries to learn how to use its arm by, in this case, by flailing its arms around and trying to reach for this ball. Very similar to what a baby would do while it's trying to learn how to move its arms around. So now, once it has done this and figured out exactly how to move its arm, now if you want the robot to, say, balance a pole, this is a really challenging task because it's very hard to write software programs to deal with all sorts of possibilities, so different lengths of the pole, different weights. So I'm going to ask Fran to try and balance this pole here. Is this my challenging yes, task? Absolutely. Then? Okay. So, ooh, not too bad. Would you? <laughs> okay. So while Fran's trying to master this art of pole balancing, let's have a quick look at how our robot tries to learn this. So. In this video, you again see the robot's attempt at learning to balance a pole. The robot tries out various movements, looks at the effect of its action on the pole. So it tries out, the, uh, by moving it in different ways, the pole reacts in different ways, and all the time it learns. And by around trial eight, manages to learn a perfect strategy to balance this pole. So you can see that it's managed to, to keep going and very well, and unlike here. I thought I was going to beat it then in trial one to five, but obviously it did get the grasp, didn't it? Absolutely. Now, 
Another important component of human-like behaviour is the ability to re react fast and use sensors to correct actions. We give this a technical term, we call it feedback. The sensors, like your fingertips, are feeding information back to your brain about what they're actually touching. Now, I'm going to need another volunteer. If we have anybody, I'm going to... Who can I have? Do you fancy wearing our wristband? It's got such a beautiful face, I couldn't resist it. What's your name? Sanand. Sanand. Oh, lovely. Would you like to go and stand next to Ian? Okay, while Anand's being fitted with this high-tech um, array of sensors here, okay. I'd like to focus your attention on this prosthetic arm. So this is a prosthetic arm that we've been working with at the University of Edinburgh, developed and produced by Touch Bionics in Livingston. This is very much uh, a replacement limb for amputees, and these are um, fitted on real patients. And this hand can actually move very much like a human hand by in, in, in case of real patients, by using EMG signals, that's signals from the muscles of, of, of your arm. So I'm going to now try and get Fran to give me a hand, literally. Is it safe? <laughs> OK, I can close oh, yeah. and open a grip. Yeah. Let's try again. Yeah. Close wow. and open. So one thing you might have noticed is that actually, when I'm trying to shake Fran's hand with this artificial limb, I have no feel for the force that I'm applying on Fran's hand. In other words, I didn't have an idea whether I gripped her hand really tight or softly or whether there was enough force in the grip. So this is something that we're trying to work on at the University of Edinburgh to yeah. complete the feedback loop. Yeah, when we touch something, as we all know, we get a sensation through our skin, giving us a feel for when we need to adjust our grip or if we need to take our hand away if a surface is too hot, for example. Now, hopefully, yes, we've got a video here of sensory feedback. Now, this can help us adjust the force of our grip. There you go. You see, we've got a good grip on that glass bottle there in order not to drop it. But we need to be able to adjust this so that we have a more delicate grip on some things. For example, an egg. Because obviously, if you grip it too hard, we all know what happens. You've got an omelette in the making. Isn't that right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, what you see in this video is actually a robot hand being controlled by EMG signals, sort of signals from the muscles of your arm. So these are very similar to what you would use in a real prosthetic hand. However, again, the point is that there is no feedback. So in other words, the robot doesn't know with what force it's, a, it's gripping the egg or, or an object that it's trying to hold. So let's switch back to our live demo here. So Ian is wearing a glove equipped with sensors. And you can actually, at the top left of your screen, <laughs> visualize the force that Ian is applying to different um, index fingers and thumb and so on. And there's a little graph that uh, tells you the force. <laughs> but what you probably don't realize is that Anand here is able to feel the pressure that Ian's applying to his hand without even looking at the screen. He can do that by actually feeling the pressure, feeling the mo little motors vibrating on his handcuffs. So this is a way, this is a novel way of providing feedback about the grip force. So for example, if now Ian picks up this cup very gently or very tightly, the cuff on Anand's hand would vibrate appropriately. Can you feel that, Sanand? Yes? Does it tickle? Does it? It doesn't hurt you? No. So basically, that would be the sensors that would, would be on us to help us figure work out the, out the, the thing. Yes. That's fantastic. Is that OK? Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Sanan, for doing that for us. That's lovely. So, so you've seen various elements that are needed to create intelligent, autonomous robots. Sensing, planning, reasoning, and moving and learning to adapt. But the biggest challenge of them all is to bring all these capabilities into one big system. And one very good example we've developed at the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh is this Connect4 playing robot. Now, the Connect4 playing robot has a camera for its eye, a computer for its brain, and a robot hand to move. Now, I love Connect4, so I need a volunteer to come and play Connect4 with me. Aha, I think we'll have you, sir. Absolutely. What's your name? Jack. Jack, come so, here, there you go. So as you see, the camera has, has a way of detecting pieces in their location. And when Jack makes his move, 
the artificial intelligence programmed into the computer calculates the next best move, then the robot's hand, like he's doing right now, actually reaches for the piece and makes its best move. So am I right in thinking now that this robot arm is actually playing a game as you and I would play, connect four, and thinking for itself? Absolutely. So That's there, are, there, are, there, are, there are three key elements to this game. One is obviously sensing. So the camera is there to actually sense the location of the pieces and identify the state of the game. Then the artificial intelligence or the brain behind the game playing figures out what is the next best move to do so that it doesn't get beat or actually it can beat the opponent it's playing against. And finally, probably the toughest bit is actually for the robot to reach for the the actual piece and put it in the location where it wants to. Jack's taking this very, very seriously. It's almost like a game of chess. You know, the concentration there is amazing, isn't it? Oh. So, so, so while, while Jack is, is wow, he's doing that <laughs> amazingly well, so you, you can see that it's actually really hard to put together all these capabilities together in an even very small robot like this, working in very controlled environments and without any obstacles. Oh, I'm, just, along I'm absolutely intrigued as to who is going to win this one. Okay, I think we're going to be here for a bit. <laughs> I uh, say, uh, no, I, I don't think we are, in actual fact. Oh, wrong <laughs> move, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it was looking so promising. <laughs> Big round of applause. <laughs> Very well done, Jack. <laughs> Look at that, it's doing a little dance. <laughs> you were beaten by a robot, you're pretty brave, to be fair. Actually, you did almost as good as any other guy who managed against this robot. Very well done. So now, imagine getting all of these things to work on a two-legged, human-sized robot that is free to walk around. Absolutely, and we've seen for some time that people have dreamed of robots that look and behave like humans, that walk, talk, and think. From Marvin in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to Data from Star Trek, one of my favorites, we've also seen that making these robots for real involves some really difficult science because, let's face it, we humans are complex and very difficult to copy. So now I would like to introduce you to one group that has really risen to the challenge and have brought with them and developed the robot you've all come to see today. They are Honda. Asimo, one of the world's most advanced humanoid robots. In many ways, Honda can best be defined by its pioneering research and development in advanced humanoid robotics. It requires state-of-the-art technology, a spirit of innovation, a dedication to enhancing people's day-to-day -day lives by expanding mobility, and a focus on serving customers and creating products that benefit society. In a world designed for humans, engineers first focused on developing legs that could walk independently. In 1986, Honda's first experimental humanoid robot, E0, took its first successful steps, but it was too early to say that the robot was truly walking. E0 took about five seconds to complete each step, and it could only walk in a straight line. Known as static walking, this is different to the way humans walk. So Honda's engineers looked closely at how people walked and maintained balance to better understand the mechanisms of movement. How do knees move when people walk? How much force does each joint receive? What is the average walking speed? In their study, they found that when humans walk, they get just off balance, as if they were about to fall forward. This walking while falling is very difficult to simulate in a robot, and it was a challenge in which no one had ever succeeded. In 1988, a key milestone was reached in the E2 experimental robot by successfully imitating a human's dynamic walk. E2 could walk at a pace of three quarters of a mile per hour on flat surfaces, and successive robots in the E-series made additional progress. However, all E-series robots lacked a torso, but with control of leg movements firmly established, engineers were able to move on to the next major challenge, creating a complete robot with a body as lightweight and efficient as possible. Research and development also expanded to refine the movements of the robot's arms and hands. These efforts led to the introduction of P1, Honda's first prototype humanoid robot in 1993. 
to make a machine walking like we do was a major challenge. And it is precisely because it was a challenge that we started the project as well. In 1996, engineers achieved a number of major breakthroughs in its second prototype humanoid robot, P2. It's leading to a large range of uh, possibilities, basically. It could complete simple tasks like... Already today, we have a lack of personnel in hospitals and rest homes. So Azimbo can in the future help the nurse to, to have more time to do basic tasks and uh, give more time to the nurse to take care of the patient. That's one thing. But also, if you can imagine um, rest homes, sometimes people have to, be, have to go to rest homes because they are not able to manage themselves anymore. If these people can have a robot at home to take care of their food, the safety, uh, if, if anybody is falling, he can call the doctor and uh, things like that, then it will allow people to stay at home until the end of their lives, maybe. And that's a major benefit for society. The next stage of the dream challenged engineers to create something that could function in an actual human living environment. To better also, I mean, there are a lot of of uh, tasks which um, humans are, have to perform, but which are dangerous, dangerous for their lives, like uh, fighting fires, uh, uh, cleaning polluting places. Well, Asimo can be used for that as well in the future, maybe. Compared to its predecessors, Asimo achieved better balance, was more nimble on its feet, even more... I think you need to build a new type of relationship with this type of machines. It's not a, a dog or a cat, it's not a human, it's, it's not a washing machine, uh, it's something else, it's a robot. Asimo has been equipped with voice and visual recognition technologies which allow for even better interaction with people. We started to present Asimo in science museums, uh, in symposiums, scientific symposiums and so on. And, but when we saw the enthusiasm of the children, we said, well, this is a great um, tool to create some more interest from the children for science. And as you know, we are lacking scientists in Europe at the moment. And if we can contribute a little bit to make more, to create more scientists in Europe, then that's already a, a good achievement as well. ASIMO continues to be refined and improved, moving it ever closer to the dream of developing a robot so advanced it can really help people. Much work still remains, but with ASIMO, Honda has truly taken an advanced step in innovative mobility. You've all just seen how ASIMO has been developed over the past 20 years. Recently, Honda unveiled a brand new version of this famous robot. And it is this new ASIMO that I have the pleasure to introduce to you today. Now, three things before we start. As much as it would be fantastic to run up and touch ASIMO or hug him, we do ask you remain in your seats. We also love Asimo having his picture taken, so if you want your camera phones, videos, whatever you've got, that's absolutely fine with us, not a problem. But the one thing we do ask, and Asimo loves, is if you give him a big round of applause, big cheer when he does all his performances, because he performs even more and gets very excited. So. so are you all ready to welcome Asimo? Well, I think we could do a little better than that, couldn't we? Are we ready to meet Asimo? Yeah, yeah that's more like it. Asimo, I think the people are waiting for you. First visit to Scotland, I might say. Hello, Asimo. Welcome to the Edinburgh Science Festival. Thank you, Bren and Seth. It's great to be here. It's like a dream come true. Well, Asimo, it certainly is. We are here to launch the 21st Edinburgh International Science Festival. And indeed, without the tremendous advances in science and engineering, Asimo simply would not be here today. Now, he will scan the room, and obviously, as you saw on the video, he's looking at each and every one of you and taking you in. So uh, if he waves, give him a wave back. Now, 
I'd like us to use our imaginations, if we can, and imagine that this stage is my apartment. Setu and a friend have come round for drinks, and we're going to sit at this table and have our drinks, and we would like Asimo to deliver them to us, which is actually quite easy, isn't it, Setu? Absolutely, Fran. For this request, I only need a PDA like this one. Many of you probably have that in your pockets. You can see a selection of drinks here. So I'm going to order two teas and one orange juice. And Asimo knows perfectly where to get the drinks from because the location of the bar has been pre-programmed into Asimo's memory. But it precisely needs to locate the barman. Now Asimo will receive my request through this PDA, just like this when I press enter. I'm going to the bar. Now you'll notice that Joe, our barman, is wearing a badge on his chest which Asimo can detect with its infrared sensors to receive the tray. Mr. Barman, I'm here to receive two tea and orange juice for my friends. I receive tea for my friends. Okay. I got it. Is this fine? I'll start the delivery to my friends. I'm going to the table. In performing this task, Asimo is completely autonomous. To be able to do that, we've programmed the size of the stage into his memory as well as the position of the furniture. And in order not to spill the drinks, Asimo moves slower at a speed of 1.6 kilometers an hour. I came for delivery. I brought you tea and orange juice. Look at this beautiful movement, and thanks to the movement sensors it has on its wrist, Asimo knows exactly when the tray is on the table and when it can release its grasp. Thank you, Asimo. Thank you very much, Asimo. <laughs> so the handling of the tray is a great recent improvement in Asimo's capabilities. <laughs> but but another dramatic improvement has been achieved in Asimo's ability to balance. And what better way to demonstrate this than to ask Asimo to run? I think we can do that. Are you ready, Asimo? Uh, forgot to tell you about this bit. Asimo is a very serious sports robot and likes to limber up, get a bit warmed up before he starts any exercise set up. Very sensible, if you ask me. So, whenever you're ready, Asimo. Okay, off you go. <laughs> yes, he's very pleased with himself on that one. Now, that was running in a straight line, obviously, but what's even more impressive is Asimo can actually run whilst running in a circle, in actual fact. Now, this is more impressive because it means that Asimo can compensate for what we call the centrifugal force, which means that it can lean into the turns and compensate for all that action. So now I'm going to ask Asimo to run in a semicircle of a two-metre radius. So when you're ready, Asimo, OK, go for it. What do we think? Good? Yeah. Very well done, Asimo. <laughs> mm. Now, some of you... Oh, he wants a big <laughs> cheer, please, for that one. <laughs> Such a performer, now. You may be thinking to yourself, well, what's the use in having a robot that can run? Well, I can answer that question in one word, in actual fact, safety. By forcing our engineers to solve the problem of maintaining the balance of the entire body whilst doing quick movements, we can dramatically increase Asimo's reaction time. So due to this, Asimo is far more agile and can react more quickly if something is running into it or across its path, pretty much as we saw on the computer graphics. Obviously, Asimo experiences that. So now I'd like to demonstrate that for you. So I'm going to ask Asimo to go to the foot of the stairs. But en route, Setu will stand in Asimo's path. And I'd like you to look and listen to what Asimo actually does when reacting to this. So, Asimo, could you go to the stairs, please? OK, off you go. So 
Asmo planned a movement to the stair. Then I was standing in his way. He stopped, waited for me to move away, and then continued on its path. Very clever. Very clever indeed, absolutely. Now, may I remind you that we are still in my apartment, which is very, very grand indeed, because I've got a lovely painted ceiling and a barman, which I'm really pleased about. Now, in order for Asimo to help us as humans, it needs to be able to perform simple tasks, like walking up and down the stairs. For most of us, this is easy. We do this every day without even thinking about it. But next time you're going to walk up and down the stairs, just have a stop and a think. Think about how many muscles you're using, the balance you're using, and how your brain is helping you to do this function. A toddler, for example, may be able to walk upright, but may not have the balance to, to walk up the stairs, so may still need to crawl. So, Asimo, could you climb these stairs for us, please? OK? Off you go. So easy, isn't it? Yes? And it is a really good time to remember the progressional video that we showed you at the start. When you think about the E-Series, Asimo was much slower in actual fact, even the, the previous one before the Asimo that can now run, which is great, fantastic. Now Asimo, now that you're up there, can you show us how to come down the stairs? <laughs> well, actually, Asimo is not feeling dizzy. It just first needs to simply, precisely calculate its position to be absolutely sure that it's safe to come down. And that's exactly what he's doing right now. Asimo, are you ready now? Okay, on you go. That's pretty good too, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, he's pleased with himself. Well done, Asimo, and I'm sure everybody in the room is with me when we want to congratulate you on the performances that you're doing for us today. Now, at this stage, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'd like to involve emotions into the scenario here. I'm going to ask Setu to shake hands with Asimo, which is always very, very nice. But, I mean, you might be thinking, well, what's she talking about? Because it's only a machine, and it's all down to sensors. But Asimo can see Setu. He can see you all. And it's very typical of us as humans to want to kind of transfer our human emotions into something that's moving and actually looking just like us. So, Setu. Let's shake hands to remember your visit. Very human-like. So Asmos has got very sophisticated joint and torque sensors, which allow it to actually uh, react to my movement, just like a real human. Let me try that. I push him. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Now try pull him. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Very much like a human. <laughs> Thank you, Asimo. <laughs> no, thank you, Asimo. Did you notice that Asimo is actually reacting all by itself? It's watching exactly where Setu's going and reacting with what Setu is actually doing. So thank you, Asimo, very much. Now, after all this hard work, I think you deserve a break, don't you? Yes, I think you do. And what's Asimo's favourite game, do you think? Football, someone just said over there. You want a game of football? Yeah, you want a game of football, absolutely. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put the football down in front of Asimo and ask Asimo to kick the football with his right foot. But we're not going to make life easy for him because we're just going to put the, fo the football down randomly in front of and Asimo. Can we have a volunteer goalkeeper, please? Anybody here? Okay. So what's your name? Adam. Adam. Adam, fantastic. Now, thanks to Asimo's infrared sensors, Asimo can locate the ball assume the correct position, and kick the ball to our lovely goalkeeper, Adam. But I'd like you to appreciate the um, ability to maintain the balance whilst doing this manoeuvre too. He's psyching you out. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, pretty good. 
Well done, Adam. Thank you. Oh, he's clapping you back, Adam. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good, Asimo. But I think you need a bit more training before you compete for the golden boot. <gasps> a bit harsh. Don't be angry, Asimo. You're nearly all that I dreamt of as a boy. Now let's have some fun and show the audience that robots and scientists can dance to. Oh. Let's have some music, please. <laughs> That's fantastic. I noticed you kind of graciously moved aside there and let Asmo do all the work. I think I'll leave that to Peter Crouch. <laughs> fair yes. enough, fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great, Asimo. You have proved you are a real entertainer and you've also proved that science and engineering can be fun as well. Am I right? Yeah, definitely. Right, well, sadly, our show is coming to an end now and Asimo will be waving goodbye. I hope you've enjoyed meeting it. So goodbye and thank you, Asimo, for showing us some of the things you can do. It was a pleasure being invited here. Goodbye, everybody. Hope to see you soon. As I said earlier, I've had the pleasure of working with Asimo for quite a few years now. And you'll notice that I do refer to Asimo as he a lot of the time. In actual fact, it is an it. But it is easy to forget that Asimo is not a real person. And there is no little boy in an astronaut suit in that cupboard there, I'm telling you. What we've just seen is not science fiction either or a computer-generated robot that you may have seen in a movie or on one of your computer games. Asimo is science fact a real machine designed and developed through the passions, dreams and hard work of engineers and scientists. Now we started this show looking at the robots dreamt up by science fiction writers. CP3O, Wally, Marvin, K9 to name but a few. And here we have seen one version of the real thing. But it's the writers and scientists that will keep pushing us forward to make and develop even more useful and remarkable robots. So all engineers and scientists start at school, just like many of you here. So maybe with a, just a little hard work, you could be building machines of the future. Someday, for example, I could be driving the car that you designed, or actually shaking the hands of the robot that you developed. All it takes sometimes is a dream. So thank you all for coming today. A huge thank you to Honda and Asimo for helping us open the 21st Edinburgh International Science Festival in such style. Thank you all for coming and see you all at the Science Festival. Thank you. Goodbye. The press have gone nuts for Asimo.
benefits of this robot already. Most advanced humanoid. 